Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Susan Gunn. I'm the director of the Mary Knoll Office for Global Concerns in Washington, DC. And I'm joined tonight by Drew Miller, the national coordinator for the US chapter of the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. Hi, Drew. Hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here, Drew. Drew was the person who invited me to join a delegation, the Interfaith Fellowship and Learning Tour that was organized by ICHIRP, which uh, is short for the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. And then when we arrived in Manila, we were greeted and well cared for by the National Council of Churches of the Philippines. Um, and the reason they invited us, um, they wanted international observers from around the world to come because uh, uh, a few months earlier, the U.S. State Department told us that we should give the new president of the Philippines a chance and see if, how things might change or improve for democracy, for a respect for human rights. And we were very concerned and we decided, well, okay, let's go check it out. Uh, so the, uh, ICHIRP and the National Council of Churches of the Philippines organized uh, this uh, faith and learning tour. And we had people come from Canada, the United States uh, and Malaysia on uh, this trip. It was a beautiful uh, delegation. And uh, you'll see from my slides um, what we observed, and um, it's concerning. It really is. See if I can get the slide to advance. There we go. Well, I'm sure since you joined this uh, delegation, uh, this uh, webinar, you're familiar with the history of the Philippines. Philippines has a long and intense history of human rights abuses spanning years of colonization, martial law, and ongoing armed conflicts. And uh, those of you that remember 1986, the People Power Revolution that toppled the rule of uh, the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos Sr. And at that time, martial law ended and a new constitution was adopted, which included basic civil rights protections. But uh, 2020 uh, UN report uh, concluded that effective implementation of those civil rights protections remains elusive. And the key reason for that, land owning elites and political dynasties remain entrenched. Now, you don't have to look any further than the current president, who is Marcos Jr. and the vice president, the daughter of the previous president Duterte. I joined a small group from the larger delegation to visit the southernmost island of the Philippines, Mindanao. This is the, the island in pink here. And uh, we were a four-person international learning tour, and we met with 23 uh, different individuals living on the island representing different community groups. And we asked their concerns and their experiences of their civil rights, their human rights. Uh, and we, what we heard was quite disturbing. Um, we were hosted by the Philippines Independent Church, which is an offshoot of uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Philippines, uh, Filipino people decided to to um, launch an independent Catholic church in the early 1900s. And uh, in Mindanao, we were hosted by um, their Supreme Bishop and the different clergy there. You see here um, the four members of my international group. They each have a blue bubble. Uh, starting on the left, representing the Council of Churches of Asia, was a Methodist minister from Malaysia. Uh, the second person in a yellow shirt was a Filipino American um, who is a member of the US chapter, along with Drew of ICHIRP, and then uh, a representative of the Anglican Church of Canada, um, a professor of theology from Toronto. And then and myself representing Mary Knoll uh, from the Washington DC Advocacy Office. And you see us here on our first day in Mindanao. Uh, we met with a professor of history from a local university. Um, he's the gentleman in the glasses and he really helped us understand why there has been um, protracted armed conflict on the island. Um, and I'll speak to that in just a moment. But we were also um, graciously hosted um, by Muslim and 
uh, Christian uh, church leaders um, and members, and they spoiled us. Uh, lots of karaoke. If you've been to the Philippines, you know that there is joy amidst the struggle. Well, back to what's going on in Mindanao. Well, uh, in 2014, the conflict, the long, deep 50-year conflict um, with 13 Muslim groups that make up the Moro people um, did launch a, a peace agreement that resulted four years later in 2018 with the creation of an autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. And they went have gone on to have um, their own elections. It's a, a shaky, as you can imagine, um, peace accord, yet it's, it's it happened. Um, unfortunately, in 2017, at the largest Muslim city on the island, Marawi, the Philippine government bombed out the city, completely decimated the city, um, and displaced um, at its height uh, close to 300,000 people to remove an armed Muslim group. And at that time, in May 2017, uh, the president launched martial law on the island that lasted until January 1st, 2020. Um, president Duterte also, during that time, um, deepened the conflict with the Communist uh, Party uh, and by declaring the party and their armed National People's Army as terrorist, terrorist entities. So situations uh, grew much worse on the island with both of those conflicts. Here you see the bombing of the city of Marawi uh, in 2017, and then the aftermath months later of just uh, bombed out buildings and people scattered to the winds. What were they replaced with? Uh, military personnel. Uh, so uh, two and a half years of martial law followed by a state of emergency. It's, uh, it's a um, military rule, Mindanao. And then who's there to train them and equip them and enforce them? The U.S. government. So there were already troops, um, you know, training and joint training and, and hosting equipment on Mindanao. And you probably saw the news at the beginning of March that Joe Biden has entered into an agreement to establish four new settlements of U.S. troops and equipment in the northern part of the country facing Taiwan. Um, but here in Mindanao also will receive a big chunk of $80 million increase in troops and military equipment because of their strategic position with the South China Sea. Well, our time uh, for my uh, four-person delegation in Mindanao, we met with 23 individuals representing different community groups. Um, and I'll go through a series of slides so you can see photos of some of those people and uh, you know, really compelling quotes, uh, compelling things that they said to us. First, we met with the history professor from the Mindanao State University to set the stage for us. And he explained in the early 1900s, Americans brought people to Mindanao in resettlement programs, mostly Christians, and they opened large scale agricultural production and trade, pitting indigenous people already living in Mindanao versus settler migrants. He goes on to say, there are layers of historical injustice here. There were powerful warlords and some of them gravitated to leftist ideology, Marxist Maoists, and that created a stronghold against the first Marcos regime, stretching the military to its limits. Mindanao is like a cauldron, he says. Every now and again, everything builds up like a pressure cooker. The Philippines is patient zero for social media manipulation. The models were developed here. After meeting with the professor, we wanted to learn more about the displaced people from Marawi. So we met with a sultan in charge of one community of Muslims uh, from the city of Marawi. And he told us in the siege, there was a lot of damage, more than 7,000 homes, 21 schools, 42 mosques, a church, many missing and dead. The government hasn't given assistance to families of civilians who died, more than 100. And he goes on to say, it's next to impossible that new homes will be ready by December. 
And he named December because that's the deadline, December 3rd, when people will be forced to leave these temporary shelters uh, and return to what? No homes. Uh, many of them that we met with told us that the government has built new facilities where their house once stood, um, a, um, a, a sports arena, a park, things like that. I met with um, mothers and women of, of displaced families who are living in those shelters I just gave you pictures of, and they named as their three greatest concerns the need for reliable income, clean water, and permanent homes. Basic, basic needs. They were displaced in 2017, and those are our, their needs today in March 2023. And it will just get worse after December 3rd. We just don't know. After that, we met with an attorney who described um, his work uh, defending people whose civil rights and basic rights are violated. And he says, the state does not value the dignity of human life, violating political, economic, social, and cultural rights of the people of Mindanao. The new constitution put in safeguards for human rights to avoid repeating abuses of the first Marcos regime, but abuses continued. In Mindanao, human rights violations are disturbing. They're violated by state actors against landless people, indigenous people, workers with low wages, and impoverished people who need shelter and education. We also met with a leader of an uh, indigenous community known as the LUMAD. LUMAD is a word that just means indigenous, so it's a collection of indigenous people. And he said the authorities use insurgency issues to explain their actions, but really they're seeking to protect mining and agribusiness. And since the election of Marcos, we have data from July to December that includes 65 male political prisoners and 12 female. After that, we met with the head bishop, uh, Bert Kalong, of the Philippine Independent Church. He's also the convener of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, so he had quite a bit to say about the peace process. But first of all, he spoke about red tagging, which means being labeled by the government as a communist and having posters and uh, uh, spray paint and being called out as uh, a communist, an enemy of the government. If you say the truth here, Bishop Kalong says, you will be red tagged. He goes on to say, I think red tagging will get worse. It's nonsense, of course, but it's a sign we're telling the truth. When I'm speaking to army officials, I ask them, what do you want the country to be? Is it not that people not go to war with the government? I say to them, we too don't want people to go to war with the state because they're hungry. If your stomach is filled with good things, they will be yours. He went on to speak about the importance of the peace talks. He says when peace talks are going on, the marginalized people are happier because there will be fewer human rights violations or problems. The church says to the military, there is no glimmer of hope without peace talks. We tell them to end the mutual defense treaty with the U.S. and all the rest will follow. The IFI, which is the Philippine Independent Church, always promotes peace talks, the bishop says, because talks address the root causes of violence. It's not easy to be the church in this country. We can do our things here, but we need you. We can't do it alone, the bishop says. There was a plan for an international coalition of Muslim leaders, but because of an anti-terrorism law, some churches and Muslims and Lumads are cautious and are concerned for their own security. They stopped talking. They told us it's better for you to tell others about us. Their leaders are demonized and tagged. The atmosphere is fear. After that, we met a woman who was quite fearful, and she'd only meet us um, over Zoom, uh, uh, an indigenous Subanian woman who we had planned to meet her in person, but she decided to go to someone else's house and log in on a different computer so that she couldn't be seen speaking with us, but she desperately wanted to tell us her experience. In her village, she says, the military presence is terrifying because soldiers take and question people accusing them of being members of an enemy group and everyone is tense. 
The biggest problem in the community is economic. We don't have the means or the income we need due to the militarization around the town. The men must leave to find work, and then we're not allowed to access our bank accounts because the military will suspect us of giving money to the NPA, which is the commun armed communist uh, group. So the men leave and send back money, but the women say they can't go to the banks to access it for fear of the military. After that, we met with a church leader whose adult son was a youth leader and a, a singer, and we sang some of his songs at uh, church on Sunday. His name was Is Aldeem, and she says, my son Aldeem sings songs on the stage to remind the government that they need to help the poor. We sing many of his songs in church. In 2017, his name was included in a list of 200 people, including church workers and environmentalists, to be arrested on trumped up charges. His case was dismissed, and he went back to singing and working at the church. When he went to Manila for a concert, he was followed. And then on April 10th last year, I was asleep at my home. Someone suddenly shouted outside. I looked out the window and I saw people entering through our gate. They opened it and some went around to the back of the house. And this confused me. Why would they go there? A woman in uniform shouted, wake up, we have a warrant. The dogs started barking and I said, get out of my property, I'm the owner. But they gathered in front and we were commanded to get out. I was very afraid and surprised. My husband's bedridden. I felt traumatized for a month. We were humiliated. It was Palm Sunday. We were supposed to go to church. People were passing by and they saw what was happening and they were looking. This was humiliating. When the police demanded to go in my house to search my son's room, he said, fine, I don't have anything to hide. And when they went in the house, they saw we saw a bag of weapons, grenades. The police had broken in the back door and planted evidence and my son is still in jail. I want them to answer for what they did to my son, Aldine. I want to file a perjury case. While we were there, uh, she had a, a court date uh, two days later, and the case was just continued, and Aldine is still uh, in the jail. After that, we met a woman, I mean, and she did not want to tell us where her village was located, and uh, she didn't want to tell us uh, too much about herself, and we could not take a photograph. Her husband had been killed. She doesn't know by whom, um, by the um, NPA, the, the communist NPA, or by the military. She just lives in this conflict area on their small farm with out knowing who killed her husband and what will happen next. She says, I don't know who killed my husband, the military or the NPA. I had to go into hiding with my children. I want to raise the voice of those in the countryside. Our rights are being violated, she shouted this at us. I don't want any other mother to have to go through this. I'm really struggling. This is very hard. And that's why I'm here to tell you my story. Just because we're poor, we're always trampled on. I'm so sick of it. I hope the poor will one day experience their human rights. She knew we couldn't offer her relief uh, in that moment for her, her basic needs. Um, all we could do was document her story and share it with you. And um, Drew can explain the role that iChirp plays and hopefully pass it on to the UN Special Rapporteur of Human Rights and bring on greater investigation. So our conclusions on the island of Mindanao, there is a culture of fear and special human rights concerns for the indigenous communities, for farmers, and for the internally displaced people of Marawi. And as the bishop made very clear to us, it's extremely necessary to resume the peace talks. Without these three things being addressed, life on the island of Mindanao is not a place where life can flourish. And the role of the US government there and its military is just um, increasing um, and, and funding um, these abuses to continue. I'll stop there. I wanna invite
withdrew to share what you can do to help promote and protect human rights in the Philippines. Thanks so much, Susan, for um, sharing those very uh, powerful um, testimonies and uh, stories um, and the reality of what's going on um, in the Philippines. Um, so as the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, um, it's, a, it's a global uh, formation um, and we have a specific U.S. chapter. So within the U.S. chapter specifically, um, we have a campaign that we're taking up um, for a bill called the Philippine Human Rights Act. So uh, uh, we're a solidarity organization that's outside the Philippines, um, made up of non-Filipinos. Um, but of people who see the dire situation in the Philippines um, and are for the cause of peace and justice in the country. Um, so I think I really appreciate what Susan was saying um, in, in quoting um, Bishop Kalong about uh, the need for the peace talks um, and addressing the root causes. So one of the root causes we see is that um, uh, the Philippines for hundreds of years has been uh, a colony and faced foreign intervention and invasion, um, whether it's from the Spanish or the United States. Um, and ongoing, the U.S. continues to use the Philippines as a place where um, the U.S. military can uh, use it as a, a landing place um, uh, as it seeks to advance um, its interests worldwide. So all that to say is people in the U.S., um, we want to stand firmly with the Filipino people and oppose U.S. military aid. And we view that as our role um, in joining with the Filipino people in struggle. So just some background on the Philippine Human Rights Act. If you want to look it up on congress.gov, its um, specific bill number is H.R. 1433. Um, it was reintroduced this year, uh, March 7th, um, by Representative Susan Wild um, from Pennsylvania. So um, there's actually been a campaign for many years to cut military aid to the Philippines. Even if you look back to um, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Sr., um, you can find pictures of people on the streets in the U.S. at that time saying, stop U.S. military aid to the Philippines, because it's been, again, many, many years in which um, there's been uh, military aid going to the Philippines um, that has supported human rights violations in the country. Um, uh, in recent years, in 2019, um, there was a major event that happened that also influenced the advocacy around this. Um, so Brandon Lee, who was a, uh, is an American citizen who uh, went to the Philippines to live there, to be amongst indigenous people who uh, were facing militarization um, and uh, threats against their land and livelihood, um, he was there as an environmental activist and um, also as a journalist. Um, so he would write for um, uh, a local uh, news outlet there about what was going on. Um, so he, after his colleagues were threatened and um, some of his colleagues had been killed, um, he was targeted um, uh, and uh, shot um, uh, by armed forces in the Philippines. Um, he actually survived. Um, and uh, was able to come back to the United States, but remains paralyzed today. Um, uh, the thing about Brandon's case is that, um, you know, I think it grabs attention of people in the U.S. because he's a U.S. citizen. Um, and if a U.S. citizen can be shot in the Philippines, then who would it be? But it's really one of hundreds of thousands of cases of people um, who are facing lifelong um, impacts uh, uh, because of their advocacy and wanting to advocate for um, land and life um, for the people there. Um, so that was a major event um, in 2019 um, when we began to start pushing for a formal bill in Congress called the Philippine Human Rights Act, which includes the case of Brandon. Um, it also, the, the Philippine Human Rights Act also comes after a major investigation, um, an international independent investigation on the Philippines called Investigate PH. Um, what's really important about Investigate PH is it, um, it looks at um, hundreds of cases and interviews in the Philippines, um, it, it analyzes what the situation is there in a way um, that, that looks at the bigger picture of how Philippine society is structured. And the, the findings of this report um, uh, are that the perpetuation of human rights violations by state forces have become more institutionalized in the Philippines, streamlined and entrenched. 
Um, meaning there's been more and more legislation and policy um, and activity coming forth from the Philippine government, which um, is actually uh, not just um, uh, lacking accountability, but is actually um, institutionalizing and making um, uh, the human rights violations and corruption part of the norm in the country. Um, and that the uh, domestic remedies um, that have been proposed to like bring accountability to state forces who have committed human rights violations, um, um, who have terrorized people, um, uh, they are not able to hold themselves accountable. Um, some other examples of how the human rights crisis has really become systemic in Philippine society. Um, police and military forces are perpetuating violations and obstructing justice. Investigations are not impartial. Um, the mechanisms that exist to hold police and military accountable are failing. Um, court protections in the Philippines are inaccessible, slow, and discriminatory. Um, counterinsurgency activities um, uh, are targeting lawyers um, and denying victims access to counsel. Um, and then the the use of the court system in the Philippines, um, when people do file cases and using legal channels, um, it's not actually working. The cases are being dismissed. Um, and so you can see um, how hard it is um, actually in terms of the struggle for peace and justice in the Philippines, where the courts of justice that are supposed to help people um, are actually um, uh, geared against people and in favor of those uh, with land and military power, um, which I think Susan was mentioning at the beginning um, in terms of the structure of Philippine society and, and how it is today um, that, that those who have land and power and, and money are also those who are able to influence the government and the courts in the country. Um, what's important about this especially is that, um, you know, sometimes there's um, certain presidents which are particularly famous. So President Duterte was um, the former president of the Philippines and he had a famous war on drug where there's 30,000 people killed. Um, he would make many threats against activists um, uh, and, and called for direct human rights violations against people um, very explicitly. And so he he's really infamous um, but but the situation is he set up all these systems and mechanisms in the Philippines in which it's not just limited to his term, but they're actually, um, the issues are systemic in Philippine society. And I think we see that um, from Susan's report too, in that like um, it's been over a year since, um, or, or close to over a year since um, Duterte was in power. Um, and yet these human rights issues are just continuing and there's not actually, um, any attempt by the government to really address them. Um, and then again, going back to the US role, um, since 2015, the US has delivered more than 1.14 uh, billion worth of um, planes, armored vehicles, small arms, and other military equipment and training to the Philippines. Um, in addition to the four new uh, sites for military, uh, for US military uh, in the Philippines that are being installed, um, that actually people were meeting in Washington, D.C. about this week. Um, there's also the largest um, mil military exercises um, ever happening in the Philippines in what's called the Balikatan exercises that happen every year. Um, and each year they actually get bigger and bigger. And so this year there's over 17,000 troops, joint um, Philippine uh, military and the U.S. troops <clears throat> who are working together. Um, and so even though there's this um, really intense uh, human rights crisis in the Philippines, the response of the US and the Philippine government is further militarization. Um, and so the Philippine Human Rights Act becomes especially important with these findings. Um, the Philippine Human Rights Act calls for the suspension of security assistance to the armed forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. It calls for U.S. representatives of um, multilateral development banks to veto loans to Philippine military and police, um, and then also for uh, the State Department and Department of Defense to um, uh, provide really proper reporting on what is the aid that has gone to the Philippines and how do we know it hasn't been misused. And so this is a bill which, um, uh, uh, while in some ways is often very hard to fight for because of how much the US holds on to its military power. Um, it actually is calling for very um, um, basic human rights reforms of saying we don't want our tax dollars going to um, crimes in the Philippines. 
So coming back to today um, and what's going on right now, um, uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple pictures here of events that are currently happening. So actually on April 11th, um, there were students who were protesting out in front of the US Embassy in the Philippines saying, we don't want more US military troops here. Um, they were peacefully protesting and they're uh, unlawfully arrested. Um, and then uh, right now in the United States, um, I actually met a lawyer today, his name's A.K. Guillen. Um, A.K. Guillen um, is a people's lawyer in the Philippines who's been working with different um, people's groups, especially in cases of um, massacres um, that the Philippine military has performed. Um, he has been advocating for um, groups of people who are facing uh, that violence. Um, and he has also opposed the anti-terror law in the Philippines, which is um, led, part of the legislation that um, really institutionalized um, the political repression that's happening in the country, um, giving way for military to um, uh, detain people um, and to um, uh, wiretap people and to um, not, not give them due process and judicial process before um, uh, they're prosecuted. Um, and, and so he was one of the, the leading people who um, helped petition against that um, legislation. Um, and yet he himself um, was actually attacked as well. So um, uh, he's here in the United States receiving a award from Human Rights First, um, but he had to go through a personal struggle of um, uh, his own life being threatened. He um, was uh, attacked by two on a identified men on his way home one day from work um, from his law office. Um, and was actually stabbed in the head with a screwdriver, um, but was able to survive. Um, but um, what I'm noting here is that um, we can see many cases where um, hundreds of people and thousands and thousands of people in the Philippines are really struggling for their right to life, for uh, respect for human dignity, um, for the respect for the sanctity of human life, um, and for peace and justice in the country. Um, and, you know, for us as people who want to also advocate for peace, um, we have to recognize that as the Filipino people um, suffer um, from these crimes, um, we will also uh, suffer for um, uh, the crimes that are committed against them um, and the, the ongoing um, strengthening of the, the power of the elite um, and those who are wealthy in our world. And so um, we instead wanna um, be a part of the struggle for a just and lasting peace in the Philippines. Um, and so the Philippine Human Rights is, Act is a really important way in which um, people can get engaged and recognize that um, our government is really trying to use the Philippines for its own purposes um, in, in global war. Um, and not for uh, people in the US, not for our sake or for people in the Philippines. Um, so all that to say, there's different um, ways you can get um, involved. Um, some really simple ones, um, you can sign a petition in support of the Philippine Human Rights Act that's um, on this slide and can also I can also send it to the chat, but um, it's tinyurl.com slash PHRA Action Network. Um, again, that's HR 1433. Um, uh, you can organize a lobby visit. Um, we're also going to do uh, national lobby days in Washington, D.C. and around the U.S. June 7th through 8th. Um, and so uh, we'd love to get engaged with you um, and, and be a part of this movement for just and lasting peace in the Philippines. Thank you, Drew. You give us hope. It's wonderful. And those young people who risked arrest for holding up a sign saying no more U.S. troops in the Philippines and who are now under arrest, I will remember them, um, what brave people uh, and just uh, exercising their democratic rights um, that are enshrined in their constitution but not upheld. Um, I put in the chat the link um, if you do want to send uh, a letter to your member of Congress, if you're a voter in the United States and you want to say, please uh, support uh, the um, 
Philippine Human Rights Act. You can go to that link and follow the instructions to enter your name and, and your residence and get connected to your member of Congress in the House of Representatives um, to pass the Philippine Human Rights Act. And really um, what we're asking in that act is to uphold democracy um, and to uphold uh, basic uh, civil rights and human rights. It's not asking for too much. Uh, I don't want my tax dollars uh, to be used used in these violations. Um, and Mindanao is such a clear example of the U.S. war machine and the U.S. war on terror and selling that line to the Philippine government um, and encouraging them to respond to a conflict uh, with a Muslim group um, with severe, um, overwhelming decimation of an entire city and an entire people's uh, urban center um, and leaving so many people displaced um, and delivering that message that the war on terror continues and we know for a fact that it's been um, violating uh, human rights and, and taking away people's lives around the world. Um, so as a U.S. citizen, I see it's my responsibility um, to work to pass the Philippine Human Rights Act. Um, I also want to share tonight that Drew and I um, will be at an upcoming virtual conference uh, called Ecumenical Advocacy Days, and I'll go ahead and put the link to that as well. Um, you go to advocacydays.org. Um, org. Go to advocacydays.org uh, and you'll learn about the upcoming virtual conference April 25 through 27. And uh, Drew uh, and I are involved with putting on a workshop on the middle day, April 26th at 3 p.m. about human rights in the Philippines. Um, and uh, you'll be able, um, by coming to that workshop virtually, you'll see others there and we can have a deeper conversation about what's going on. And then uh, the next day, you'll have the opportunity to join lobby visits um, with your uh, representatives in Congress, all virtually. Um, so no matter where you are in the country, um, you can join this um, Ecumenical Advocacy Days conference. There will be um, dozens of other workshops on April 25th and 26th, um, some of them domestic focused and others internationally focused, including this one um, on April 26th at 3 p.m. on the Philippines. So go to advocacydays.org um, to learn all about it. Um, well, we've been talking quite a bit Drew and I, and I want to invite anyone who has questions to go ahead um, and uh, drop them in the chat or, or the the um, Q and A, and I will find them and pick them up. Actually, I'm looking right now. Um, I see a question um, directed towards Drew uh, with iChirp. Uh, you're a member of iChirp in the U.S. What does that mean? Um, uh, uh, where are you located uh, and where's iChirp in the U.S.? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So um, iChirp, again, so um, I do want to recognize we're a part of a global movement, um, uh, which I think is also powerful to know that, like, um, you know, uh, the the Filipino diaspora is all over the world, um, and so they've they've also helped organize like um, solidarity organizations all over the world, um, whether it's like in Europe or um, Asia Pacific or Canada or the U.S. So I just want to know it's all, it's really global. Um, but that being said, in the U.S., um, uh, we're both on the West Coast and East Coast. Um, uh, and then some in the Midwest, so like um, New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., Maryland, um, uh, Virginia, um, and then also uh, Chicago um, on the Midwest, um, and then on the West Coast, up and down Seattle, Portland, um, Northern California, Southern California, as well as Hawaii um, are like where we are in the U.S., um, yeah, and again, iChirp is really, we're very, we're a grassroots uh, movement wanting to support people in the Philippines. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we we invite you and um, anyone else who wants to, to be a part of um, iChirp and uh, 
work on this together. And one more question for you, Drew. Um, can you say what people in the Philippines think of uh, the Philippine Human Rights Act? Like, are they yeah. aware of it? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think that's something that is really important to us as iChirp is that, um, you know, we recognize that um, we are a solidarity organization. We're made of people outside of the Philippines. Um, but what's really important to us is what are people experiencing on the ground that can inform our solidarity. Um, and so it's actually what I want to share is um, it's actually been um, an ask that when we send people to the Philippines and they go to different communities for years, it, people will say like, hey, like have the U.S. stop funding the, U the military here because the military is committing um, so many human rights violations and crimes against us. And so it's been a long time ask. And so um, what's been really exciting is that when we have um, introduced the Philippine Human Rights Act or gotten um, Congress um, to um, support the bill or make public announcements, um, our partners in the Philippines, whether they're unions or church communities, have been just really happy and excited about the bill. And so that, that's something that I just want to share with people is that, um, you know, and especially people of faith that the National Council of Churches in the Philippines has been like super supportive and like encouraging us to do this work. And so I um, just just want to know how it's also rooted in what people are experiencing in the Philippines directly and not like our imposition on what people should do based off of just what we think in the US. Mm -hmm. There's another question that came in that I think is, might be directed towards me saying um, that my delegation was with the National Council of Churches of the Philippines, which is you know the coalition of Protestant um, church organizations in the country. Um, and what about the Catholic church? Well, I wanna share that the Marinal Sisters, there are four Marinal Sisters in uh, Manila. Uh, and um, uh, in addition uh, to uh, being in and around Manila, there's the Marinal um, uh, Ecological uh, Center um, outside of the city. Um, I'll look up a link for that in the chat. Um, so very much um, in tune with and caring for the environment and that the country of the Philippines has been um, ground zero for climate change, um, at least in the Asia region, being hit by major what they call super typhoons over the years. And I even had um, one Marinol sister uh, from the Philippines tell me that the people of the Philippines are experiencing climate disaster fatigue. It's just one after another. So as we continue the United States to ignore our fair share of responsibility to address climate change um, and to spend the vast majority of our funds on military weapons and uh, spreading our military around the world, the people of the Philippines suffer. Um, and uh, to what end uh, is the logical question. I also wanna share, there is a, a well-known um, uh, Catholic missionary priest from Ireland, um, not a Mary Noller, um, but a Columban, uh, Shay Cullen, um, who has run a, um, a home to rescue children who are victims of sexual um, uh, violence um, and prostitution. And uh, really, he started his work decades ago because of the U.S. Uh, military bases at Clark and uh, Subic Bay. Um, and uh, th this was how the presence of the military impacted the local people. Um, it, it caused just a major spike in um, the illegal uh, sex industry, and that includes children. Um, so that's a major concern with the return of U.S. troops and the increase of U.S. troops in the Philippines. And I want to go ahead and drop in the chat the link to um, Father Shea Cullen's organization called Preda, P-R-E-D-A, and he's a uh, he he's an active writer. He has a column in the English newspaper, the Manila Times, and uh, you can find his latest writings on his website, um, Preda. Um, so uh, there are. Um, 
people speaking out uh, very bravely, like Bishop Kalong, and he said, we can't do it without you. Um, and here we are in the, the comfort and security of our homes in the United States. And I'm just asking um, if you could um, click on the link to send a letter to your member of Congress um, and ask them to take responsibility and investigate the use of our tax dollars um, and are for their going towards um, human rights abuses in the form of, of um, financing military um, uh, troops and equipment in the Philippines. Um, Drew, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything about um, coming to ecumenical advocacy days and what people will hear from you or anyone else from iChirp there. Yes, um, I think Susan did it pretty well, um, but I think, uh, you know, I, um, Susan was actually one of, um, um, her report back was one of four different um, trips in the Philippines, going to four different areas in Mindanao. Um, and so in this upcoming um, workshop we're going to do on the Philippines, it's also going to hear from other areas um, that were visited as well, where similar issues came up. Um, and so, yeah, just hope you will join us. Oh, there's a really compelling question in the chat um, uh, from my good friend, Russ Testa from Franciscans, asking about what about China? You know, that's the pushback when we ask for passage of the uh, Philippine Human Rights Act. And um, I, I'd like to just say something and then turn it over to Drew, because I'm sure he has a strong opinion about that. You know, many years ago when I was um, yo much younger, I had um, the wonderful blessing in my life to be sponsored by the National Council of Churches of the USA to go live in mainland China and work with the China Christian Council. Um, and I lived in rural areas, um, training middle school teachers of English. Um, these people had not seen a foreigner since the late 1940s, you know, because in 1949, the communist government um, uh, gained control and uh, many foreigners who were there had left. Um, so I saw my role as um, building, um, you know, being a bridge of understanding and friendship and crossing deep divides, um, being brave and being willing um, to take risks uh, and try, try new culture um, and listen to new perspectives. Now, how about uh, our US government just do one inch of that? Yes, so dialogue and um, diplomacy. Uh, Joe Biden has said that the number one priority of our foreign policy uh, under his presidency um, is protection of human rights. I'd like to see that in action. Even just one, one tenth of the expenditure going towards our military. I'd like to see dialogue and uh, diplomacy with China. They are our enemy if we name them so. Um, so, you know, we have the power to control our, our own actions, uh, and uh, if we could just do even the littlest bit, um, we could um, break through uh, these impasses. The former president of Korea um, was working hard on that, and we had a, a, a real hope and vibrancy on the Korean Peninsula, and that's China through North Korea. And what is the Philippines? You know, the Philippines is located just under Taiwan, and uh, it's it's all related to um, animosity and fear, a culture of fear and a culture of exclusion. Um, so I just ask the little bit each of us can do um, to build bridges of friendship and understanding. And you know, my going to the Philippines was one step uh, in that direction, and it's made me incredibly passionate about passage of the Philippine Human Rights Act. It's not asking too much um, to uphold democracy um, and the protection of human rights. We have to start there. Drew? Yeah, I think Susan said it about the point of like, Biden has said human rights first, and there needs to be action with that. Because um, again, I think, um, I think with the how the US is responding to China, I'll be honest and say the Philippine Human Rights Act is an uphill battle. Um, like it's it's very tough. I've heard many times this, 
you know, staffers in Congress saying like, oh, you know, we can't, you know, support the bill because of um, we need, there's the issue with China um, and we can't let our guard down there. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle for sure. And I think that's why for us as ITRIP, we also want to help build a movement around it of um, people who are willing to take this up because, um, yeah, it, it's not going to come easy um, for sure based off of like um, how the power structure is in the U.S. And I think um, how, you know, firmly um, uh, the U.S. holds on to its military goals. Um, but yes, I think building the movement to um, uh, push against it is what's going to be uh, really important. Um, because also knowing that even when a congressional staffer says no or Congress says no, it's also a way to educate people and tell more people about what's going on in the Philippines. Um, and that's what's also really important to us in, um, in terms of um, building a movement for peace in the country. Drew, there's another question in the chat related to this, but asking what about the role of the United Nations and how, how is ICHRP communicating um, or have they communicated in the past with the UN as another avenue for protecting human rights? Yeah, so um, we actually just had someone from ICHRP return from a visit to the United Nations um, uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva um, uh, and in meeting with special rapporteurs like on different issues and extrajudicial killings. So we do um, do lobby at the UN. Um, so I, one of the issues that actually we're learning that the special rapporteurs are particularly interested in is that... Um, uh, there's this practice of red tagging in the Philippines where it's like um, uh, oftentimes activists or um, uh, dissenters or even journalists, um, anyone who kind of takes a progressive view or um, a view even just supporting human life or may, um, uh, I guess, like embarrass the government for their crimes, um, often will get red tagged of say, oh, you're, you're a communist or not just a communist, but like a communist terrorist um, is often how it's described. All that to say, that doesn't just happen in the Philippines. That happens um, all over the world, where um, the Philippine government is actually um, endorsing and like encouraging red tagging um, uh, of activists outside the Philippines. So even ICHRP as an organization, we have been red tagged um, uh, after we were we released like a. Um, a uh, statement like criticizing a particular leader in the Duterte administration and calling for um, Magnitsky sanctions, um, which are like sanctions against individuals um, uh, who are human rights violators. Um, and so that's after we did that, they actually came out and tagged ICHRP, uh, red tagged us um, in like a public statement. So all that, my point of that to say, connecting it back to the UN is that's actually one of the issues the UN is interested in that like, it's not just in contained in the Philippines where that practice is, but actually all over where there's activists um, who um, are supporting human rights issues in the country. Um, so uh, um, yeah, th that, that's one particular aspect of the UN work and it's something we'll continue to lobby along with Philippine partners who often go there as well. Well, I'm just gonna drop in the chat. I did see an article on the World Council of Churches website about the visit just last week uh, from uh, Mervin from the National Council of Churches of the Philippines at the United Nations. Um, so the work goes on. The United Nations is an important venue and uh, where we, we, we build solidarity, but also we hold, um, violators accountable. Um, so we, we begin there and we don't stop, uh, we keep going. Um, so these violations, these human rights violations, um, some even call them war crimes. Um, and I would say that the complete um, uh, leveling of the city of Marawi um, is a war crime, um, that it was in, you know indiscriminate violence on civilian people. And now here they are left without their homes and their livelihoods and, and no hope. And I hope to um, learn the outcome after December 3rd, when the community has to leave the temporary housing. Um, 
where where did they go? Um, these are people who were, you know, urban people, not not farmers, people who lived in Marawi and had businesses there and jobs, and they they want to return to their property, uh, and it they have not received the respect and recognition. Um, they have not been involved with planning by the government of the Philippines, and the United States continues to come to the island of Mindanao and pour in more troops and, and more military equipment, uh, not only turning a blind eye to the conflicts, but also training, training the Philippine um, military to engage in their conflicts this way, rather than um, building peace and democracy in the country. Well, I do hope to see some of you again at Ecumenical Advocacy Days. Uh, go to advocacydays.org and it's online. Uh, probably be in person next year in Washington, D.C. Uh, but this will be our third and probably final year to have it online, April 25th through 27th. And I also just want to say you should follow iChirp uh, on social media you'll get the latest of what's happening on the ground uh, in the Philippines and their understanding of the politics there uh, is a great gift to me. Um, and I'm proud to stand with Drew and everyone else uh, from iChirp and the National Council of Churches of the Philippines. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Drew. Thanks everybody. I'll be emailing out the recording of tonight. I hope you can share it with others. Thank you. Good night. Good night.